Well, good morning. We are getting started and um, we're just a minute late. Uh, snow on my road made it difficult. So uh, mo most everything was cleared out, but... Um, So, um, we did not have Bible study on Monday, so if you um, miss Monday, there isn't a video to catch up on, and so our last time meeting was last Wednesday, thank you, and um, we don't have any um, online support today, as far as during the, the live portion, but we can pray for Sean Bassler. Um, she got a new... Um, puppy that um, she was training and um, the puppy was playing with her older dog and and then the older dog slipped the puppy was underneath oh. and broke the puppy's neck oh, man. and so she is she she left yesterday to Spokane because uh, or technically Pullman because the WSU veterinary clinic said that they would try because they were surprised because the puppy still had movement. So she's back today, though, right? I think so. Yeah. I mean, but wasn't going to be able to be back this morning. I mean, I think she's coming right. back. I so mean, she's safe, safe back. Um, if probably most of you know, but um, longtime member of our Bible study, but she hasn't been with us for years. Carol Johnson passed away, and so we will pray for Scott and. Um, so, uh, so let's pray this morning. Loving Heavenly Father, we give thanks for this day. And um, Lord, we, we lift up uh, Scott to you and um, we thank you for uh, both of his parents. And, um, and Lord, as Carol uh, has survived but suffered many years with her throat and, and really the challenge of being able to speak and and breathe and cough and um, and then a number of health complications in these last few years uh, thank you that Scott has been able to be here and uh, be with his mom um, after the loss of Roger um, we rejoice in our hope and um, and our strong conviction that Carol is with you uh, no more pain no more tears no more suffering um, reunited with her husband we pray for Scott and um, and his grief, and uh, thank you, Lord, that he was able to have this time with her. Um, we do lift up Sean and pray for her puppy, and uh, pray, Lord. Um, we do pray for healing, and um, and that the puppy wouldn't suffer. Um, be with uh, her. Lord, for us this morning, as we have the gift and ability to be able to be in your word and be, and be reminded of who you are. And, um, and so, Lord, may, uh, may we grow in our knowledge of you today. May we, um, may we hear your word. May you speak into our hearts. And um, already we confess that we um, are amazed at who you are and uh, and what you have done. So bless us in our study, in Jesus' name, amen. So we are in um, Colossians chapter 1, and I think we're at verse 15. I have to look at that for sure, but we we were a little more slow getting through than than what I planned, but... We had a good discussion last Wednesday, and so that's what really counts. Um, yeah, we are in nine. We're even slower than I thought, so there we go. Um, so we heard Paul's Thanksgiving, and now we're going to hear um, his prayer report. Um, and uh, again, this is a typical feature of Paul. Um, what he's praying for them um, will, in in part, 
be predictive of some of the things that he's going to deal with. Um, let me begin reading with verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you for the knowledge of his will through spiritual wisdom and understanding. Um, he just talked about Epaphras, the one through whom they heard the gospel. Um, Paul affirmed his credentials as a faithful minister. And it is Epaphras who told Paul about the church that got planted in Colossae. 120 miles um, east, a little bit north, Lycus Valley, um, smaller city than, than Ephesus, which is one of the largest cities of the Roman Empire. So we get a prayer report, the gospel spreading. Um, somebody that Paul um, witnessed to, uh, had relationship with, uh, takes the gospel and um, plants a church. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Um, remember that Paul's on a mission. And, you know, in, in this study, we're talking about radical discipleship. He's called to bring the gospel out into the world. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. Um, it doesn't stop him from preaching the gospel to Jews first, because um, that was God's saving plan, first to the Jews and through the Jews to the world. Um, Paul wants to see his brothers and sisters of the covenant who um, have the same heritage um, be saved. Um, but he's not going to stop at Jews. He's going to keep going. So, winning, um, success, it's not about my name. It's not about my reputation. It's about the advancement of the kingdom of God. It's about Jesus and his gospel and his kingdom, not my little fiefdom. And um, so, um, Paul prays not just for his churches, but for any churches. Now, it's you could look at this and probably, you know, this church came about in some way related to Paul, so there's kind of a tree there, but again, it, it's not about that. It's about the fact that we want to pray for the success of the kingdom of God and for churches and for believers, and there is no competition. Um, so we hear about a fellowship that's being formed, and we pray, and we pray regularly. Um, now, because there's relationship, because Epaphras uh, heard the gospel in Ephesus underneath Paul, um, he's going to Paul. Um, some concerns. So, let's hear what Paul prayed for. To fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Um, so he, he's praying for them for spiritual maturity, for them to grow up in their faith. Um, Paul will say this to the Romans, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Um, it is through our minds that we actively participate in God's work in our life. Um, it's now, we want to we want to again learn how to think biblically. So um, when we use the term heart, what feature does biblically does that organ represent as far as the way we humans function? Any guesses? Will. Will. Exactly. Volition. The place from which we decide. That which moves us. The biblical idea of the heart is the will. Um, feeling. What biblical organ is associated with feelings? Well, Your guts. Emotions. Oh, okay. Your, so when, when the Bible is sitting there and talking about your feelings and using a physical image of your body, it refers to your guts. Okay. Your your mind is the same thing that we think about. It's the place in which you reason, in which you um, 
in which you make decisions and arbitrate. It's, it's your thinking rational faculty. Um, now, we're concerned about, you know, our total transformation. It's an issue of the heart. It's an issue of the mind. Um, those are the two main bodily organs that get focused on um, because it's from the, the heart uh, that you will decide, ultimately act, and it's from the mind that helps determine your steps. So, um, and notice that you, we pray. You notice that when I pray today, I prayed for us that we would hear God's word and understand. Um, and, and it's a good thing to pray. This is a spiritual battle. Um, we get attacked with ideas that are in contradiction to the ways of God and the teachings of God. And one of the great things is, is that if the enemy can deceive us in such a way that we don't even see or don't even perceive that what we're doing is against God's word, we'll continue in that because we won't know. Um, now, the Holy Spirit can convict us with a sense, and then that gets us thinking. But um, it is through our mind that we process. And this is the part with maturity. Uh, again, thinking of, of Romans, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his perfect good will. Um, the idea of growing up in your faith is not just being told what to do, but understanding why God wants you to do this so that you own it. Um, and so this is what he's praying for for them, that they would grow up, that they would, um, that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Um, that they would think um, in spiritual wisdom here, that which comes from the Holy Spirit and is aligned with the ways of God. Um, you know, I think it's, I think, you know, we are, I think we're blessed today with, with the ability to talk about these things because of the way that we've analyzed um, the human condition. We, we have this language now of a worldview, and we understand that the, the story that you live by isn't just what you think, but it shapes everything that you think. It's like a pair of glasses that you put on. Um, so one of the things that we're called to do, be renewed, um, have our minds filled with all spiritual wisdom and insight, is how do we live into this story? If this is the true story of the whole world, which we're convinced that Jesus is the true story of the whole world, then, it's, then, then we sit there and we say, okay, what story am I living by? What, if, if I choose these sorts of actions or, or, if, or if my guts betray this sort of anxiety, am I living out of the peace that comes from Christ or am I more living out of a different story? Um, you know, and this is some of the things that over this last year, as we've been grappling with our, the conditions of our society, they're going to want to shape us. They're going to want to form us. There's been a lot of feeders into our, into our way of thinking that would move us towards hate, um, that would move us towards um, demonization, oversimplification, um, rage, fear. Now, we're supposed to be in the world but not of the world. We're supposed to be aware of the forces that are going on so that we can navigate and we can be children of light and, and help people come and have hope because there is no hope outside of Jesus, no true hope. Um, but if our way of thinking, if our mind is so filled up with the world stuff that we're not properly stepping back, it's going to be hard for us to grow up in our faith. So we should pay attention about what goes into our minds. This is a constant thing that you'll get with Paul. Um, what you feed your mind will determine the shape of your mind. If you fill it with a whole bunch of terrible stuff, it's not good for you. Um, so, we want you to grow up, have spiritual wisdom, have understanding, 
um, verse 10. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way. Um, we do this for you, but we also do it because of our love of Jesus. He gave his life for you. He saved you. Um, don't let that be in vain. Um, live a life worthy. Um, our first our first book that we studied in this study of radical discipleship, Paul's letters from Ephesus, it, um, was Ephesians. And right in the middle of Ephesians, axios, worthy, uh, picturing an axis. Here's the life of Jesus. Here's the life that you live in response. Let these be things of equal measure, of equal weight. Out of all that Jesus has done for you, out of the life that he's lived, out of the teachings that he give, live your life in balance with that, um, of equal weight. Take seriously his teaching. Take seriously his example. Remember that you have been bought for a price. Now, they didn't hear Paul, but they heard one of Paul's disciples, somebody that Paul discipled in the name of Jesus Christ. And this is Epaphras. But, you know, what is the Christian life? Well, it's following the master, who's Jesus, learning his ways, beginning to live his sort of life, um, seeking now in relationship to be obedient and to follow his call. And, and a big part of that is, is now you help other people grow up into their faith. And, and you can only give away what's been given to you. And so you've been given his teaching, you've been given his example of life, you're adopting his values, um, you're in relationship with him. Those are the things that you have to give away. Paul would give those things away. Um, disciple is a, is a helpful term for us, though we don't use it much anymore, but maybe another one is apprentice. Same idea. And you come under a master and you become their apprentice so that you learn their way of life. And you begin to look something like them, you, especially when it's this. Jesus is the master of living. This is about becoming truly human. Um, so you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way. Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Um, this is very practical. Um, I, Sh Sherry commented coming in that she enjoyed the sermon this Sunday on beauty. And, um, you know, and, and this is the part where um, bearing fruit, glorifying God, he wants us to live a beautiful life. Um, he wants us to live a good life, a life that works. Um, the Greeks made this observation, and, and you will find it affirmed in Scripture. The good, the true, and the beautiful all go together. Um, they, 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 none of these things need rationale they are self-justifying. Um, there's reality. And, and as much as you understand and live in accordance with reality, as much as you live in grain with the universe, it will go well with you. Um, but when you live in grain, when, when, when things are going the way that, according to the truth, it's good. And it's good... In, in just the reality that this is right because it's true see how the this these concepts go together and you can talk about intellectual goodness you could talk about moral goodness you could talk about just the being of goodness just you know like something is good the nature of it it, it has integrity integrity is another word for truth and when things have integrity and they're good we find beauty in them. 
And, um, and so the call here, the prayer, growing up, maturity, it's tough. It's hard. Um, it, it's going to be painful. It's about learning to pick up a cross like Jesus and willingly suffering. It's going to bring with it um, persecution from a world that doesn't like um, the light and wants to stay in the darkness. But understand that the call is for your good. And he wants you to bear good fruit. You were made for it. Um, you know, it's one of the things that we, we many of us probably find very depressing about some of this COVID stuff is I've, heard, I've had conversations with a number of people where it's like the show Groundhog's Day, the movie, where every day just feels like the next and what's really going on and, and, and how do I make a difference? Because we were made to bear good fruit, to make a difference. Um, you live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. You know, we discover more about God as we live into his will. We, you know, and this is, this is somewhat related to the Hebrew idea of knowledge. I can give you a theoretical um, description of something, but the tacit experience of it's a whole other thing. I, 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 you know, I, I, I talked a little bit last week about how my son Brennan is funny. And I can tell you about that. And if I tell you a story, you'll get a better idea than if I just say that he's funny. But the best thing is, is for you to have a relationship with him. And then you'll get the idea. Oh, he's funny like this. Um, so, Brennan, so, you know, we made the decision on Saturday looking at the weather, um, to say, okay, we're just going to do online services on Sunday. And then, and then we talked through and we reached out to the worship team and, um, and all the worship team were willing to come in though, to make the service happen. And we had some ideas, you know, we were prepared just to do a th three, you know, basically three or four people, but, um, people came out and we, we were able to do the online service. My son was one of the ones videotaping and, um, I turned 50 on Wednesday, last Wednesday, and um, and then on Friday I threw my back out and I have no, I, 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 you know, I don't know why, you know, it's so great, you know, this is the, you know, right, this is what happens as you get older, you, you cough and then you throw your back out, who knows what I did, but I threw my back out. So set Friday I'm like, after I did it, I'm like flat on my back for the, the rest of the day because I can't even find any position not to be in pain. Saturday, I'm a little bit better. I have a three hours, I have two, I, I'm, I'm on Zoom for three hours straight though, sitting in a chair, and, and then I'm kind of laid out for the rest of the day. And then Sunday, I'm, I'm a little better, but it, it, I, I was on Muscle Relaxer and, and Advil through the whole sermon. And, um, and so, but just, but just before the sermon started, um, and, well, just before the service started, I, I felt like I could do some yoga stretching and my back would allow me to so that it would help as far as just, so I'm not like, you know, hunched over. So <laughs> my son sits there and he says, after everything, when we're driving home, he says, Dad, I can't believe you. I'm, I'm out there and all of a sudden you disappear and then the next thing I know, you're doing your yoga stretches. And he just starts laughing. And, he's, and um, it, you know, and so he likes to give his dad a bad time. But, you know, that, that would, you know, and, 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 and my other kids like to do the same thing. So Hannah is now, because, you know, today is Ash Wednesday. And so sitting here thinking about, um, I, for, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give something up for Lent. So that as my body sits there and says, wouldn't it be nice if you had this? I will use that as an opportunity to focus my attention on Jesus. And, um, and you know, and we were talking a little bit because traditionally you call the day before Ash Wednesday Fat Tuesday. 
and uh, my wife made pancakes last night. And I go, you, you're doing it. It's Fat Tuesday. You're, you're doing pancakes. And she goes, what? Oh, I didn't even realize. I just was making pancakes because it sounded good. And, um, and so, um, so we're sitting there and, you know, the kids are like, Fat Tuesday, because, you know, that's a little bit more of a Catholic tradition. But, and, um, and so kind of reminded them of those things that we've taught them before, but, you know, they've forgotten because they're not quite as important. And, um, and so I said, well, I, I think for, for uh, Lent, I'm, I'm going to observe the fact that I won't have any Diet Coke or Diet Pepsi. No, no. <laughs> and, uh, and so, so Hannah sits there and she's just like, you know what? I'm going to tell everybody my dad's a pastor, but he has a Coke addiction. It's going to be the best <laughs> thing ever. And um, so... You can, I, can, I can tell you something abstractly and I can say it's funny. I can tell you stories and you can have some idea because those stories give more of the sense. But when you experience something else. Um, Isn't that the whole Mardi Gras thing? They party on Tuesday and then repent on Wednesday for the the, Yes, the question was, isn't that a whole Mardi Gras thing? And, <laughs> It, it's kind of missing the point, isn't it? Yeah. I, you, you know, let's uh, let's go sin extremely, and then we'll go ask forgiveness, and because we're going to enter into this season of repentance. But uh, but but growing in the knowledge of God, when you live the good life, when you do good things, when you participate in goodness. All of it flows from God. All of it comes from God. You come to know him more. Um, so that's what Paul's praying for. And this is fundamentally a prayer of maturity and growing up in Christ. Being strengthened with all power according to the glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father. Okay, so when it comes to your maturity and it comes to you growing up into your salvation, you have a part to play, but the weight is upon the is upon God through who works through his holy spirit. To do this work in you yeah you know this is, is so I, for me I find the image of participation very helpful um, the Holy Spirit is not only my personal trainer he also is the source of power and strength to help this all happen um, he does the heavy lifting but in that process he helps make me strong so that I'm not only, it's not only him, but it's also me. Um, but what this does, what it should do, is remind us again of grace. Um, grace is not opposed to effort, but it is opposed to an attitude of earning. Um, but it also is, this is why I pray. Um, and this is why I pray for God's will and his help and his work and his purpose to be done in my life because it's more about him than it is about me as far as who saves me I made the choice but it was really his work and who grows me up it's really his grace but I do choose I mean this is the part where there's that tension and participation but all the pressure is not on you he doesn't expect you to have all the answers or to know the path or to have all wisdom and understanding. That's his part. You get to look to him. You get a, I mean, and this is the part where you grow in this relationship and, um, and instead of worrying about what everybody else thinks, you focus on his will, his purpose, and you can stop worrying because he's kind and he's patient and he's loving. But just so you know, and it comes out here, he wants to build those same qualities in you. That you would be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might 
so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father. This is about the good life. This is about enjoying. This is about goodness. This is about rightness. Um, now, the more that you get on board with really letting Jesus be the leader of your life and seeking the Holy Spirit to fill you and to guide you and to direct you, the more passion and joy you will have in the process, because you get it. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, I had a nice conversation with uh, somebody from the congregation yesterday via Zoom, um, and uh, and and she we were talking a little bit. You know, we were in the middle of a of, of a meeting, but it was before the meeting started, and she was talking a little bit about how much she enjoyed the congregational meeting. And, um, and she, you know, she said, you know, Ralph and I was just laughing for you because I know that you're a perfectionist and you're all, and it's not going to plan. And, and, um, and I'm like, yeah, I got to go to character school that day, didn't I? That was, that was, that was, but, but there is a part where it's like, okay, wasn't, it wasn't as a plan, but it did. It was stretching. You know, I, another person said that you know the only time they really realized that I was frustrated was when I I went, oh, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, you know, and, and it's like, okay, well, that's good because you know I was really frustrated on the inside, but that was just part of the story. I was also praying. I was also trusting. I was looking at the situation and I was laughing a little bit because I still haven't showed you the video of SNL Zoom Church, but it really looked like that. And, you know, and so all those things are going on and that's the way that life is. But when you're focused on Jesus and then you pray and then you realize, okay, didn't go to plan, but what I really care about is your will to be done. And part of this is to sit there and say, so how am I going to respond? Because I have that choice. I'm going to character school going to learn a little bit about just humility and patience today. Dang it. Um, I'm sure it was no surprise to God. <laughs> it was no surprise to him. But, but will you frame situations that way? When things are going difficult, will you sit there and go, okay, Lord, this is time for character school, and, there, and, and I want to look like you in the midst of this. Um, Endurance, patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father. There's, again, one of those, we talked about this last week, Paul's practice of thanksgiving and what a wonderful discipline that is to train us on a life of grace. Everything, every good gift comes from him above. Um, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light? Um, you have all the rights and privileges of Jesus himself. You, you share in the Son in what has been given. This is the inheritance rights. Um, we live in Jesus. We're the body of Christ. Um, and so he's praying that we would grow up and that we would live fully understanding our position where we are because of what Christ has done for us. So saints mean people of. Saints. That, so, yes. Um, to share in the inheritance of the saints. In the New Testament, saints is not a special class of Christian. It is, it is the only class of Christians. The, the, the word there for saint is hagios. Um, it is the word for holy. And so we have the um, Panuma Hagios, the Holy Spirit. We are holy because the Spirit of Christ is in us and he makes us holy. He has set us apart. He has, sanct he has um, justified us, which says all of our sins, past, present, and future, are no longer credited to us. Instead, it's been declared we're set free. Right now, he is in the process of sanctifying us 
helping us grow out of death into life so that we might live the new life that is ours in Christ. And one day we will be glorified where no more sin, no more death will ever touch us or be part of us. Um, and all of that is the work of the Holy Spirit. The word for sanctify is this same word group of hagios, to holify. <laughs> um, you, you are sanctified right now because the Holy Spirit lives in you. So in the New Testament, not a special class of Christian, it's the only class of Christian. Um, Jesus has qualified you for that. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. There's no way that you could achieve it. It's been given to you. Um, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son that he loves, in whom we have redemption. When you hear the word redemption, you it's a, it's a picture word. The pictures typically are lost on us because we... We're, it's not our culture, and we're, you know, we're, we, we may have some idea. Um, you know, we used to redeem bottles, right? And you have this bottle, and then you take it, and you turn it in, and then you get money in return. Redemption is a money that's been paid for you. The, the picture is, is that you were a slave in the kingdom of darkness. Um, and there was nothing that you could do about it. And then Jesus came, and through his death, he purchased you out of the kingdom of darkness, and he set you free out of that slavery, bringing you in, not only to the kingdom of light, but now into the family of God and his children. Um, now, one half of Roman society were slaves. And if you were in that half, you were pretty much, well, you were, you were lesser than citizens some slaves had you know some privileges that some citizens didn't have but by and large to be a slave the goal was not to be a slave but sometimes you're just stuck you could buy your freedom but it may take your whole life to do it and sometimes you could never do it and there you go in that society this idea of redemption is a much clearer picture people were getting sold into slavery all the time but every once in a while, people were being, were buying their freedom out of slavery. Um, so this is a more emotive concept for them. But, I mean, probably all of us have these times in our life where we feel trapped, like some power dominates us and has us under its thumb. Jesus has purchased your redemption. That it's functioning out of the same, the same, the same metaphor. So, when you when we think about the cross of Christ and His work on the cross, that He, that the cross is the place where the battle happens. Jesus fights for us and He defeats the enemy. Resurrection is the vindication that all that He claimed and all that He said, and and what and what He claimed His death would mean, was actually true. But the real decisive place of, of the victory isn't the, the empty tomb. The empty tomb proves that what happened on Good Friday was victory. Now, that, it's a great picture. We talk about it in the Alpha Course. The cross, the work of Jesus on the cross, is a little bit like a diamond. It's multifaceted. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on that, we, that are, are images, metaphors, pictures, trying to describe the work of Jesus. So, out of every area of life that's significant, you'll find a picture that says, oh, what Jesus was doing on the cross was something like this. So, one of the areas of life is the marketplace, where you go and you work and you buy and you sell, and, and, and through that you live. And in the marketplace, especially in that era, slavery was a huge part of how the entire economy was put together. And so, if you're out there and you're, and you're working, and what, half of our life is, you know, in our work? 
and you're walking through the marketplace and what you see day in and day out is people being sold into slavery and you know that the entire system is built upon slavery that it's so built on slavery there's no possible idea of eradicating slavery because that would just be basically saying get rid of the economy but you know that it's not great and if you're free you don't want to ever have to sell yourself into slavery but what happens if you do well the very best thing is for you to be set free no longer be a slave well that's what Jesus was doing on the cross something like that oh I get it so you're in relationship in fact the relationship is the closest of all relationships it's a husband and a wife um, and yet there's a fisher in the relationship and you're no longer getting along. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> you know, I mean, see, the, the, the images are coming at us in ways that we can relate with. We see that. Divorce happens. Um, people, you know, who, who, who at one point, you know, had fond affections for one another are now at odds with one another. But then you work it all out and you're reconciled and then you're back together that's what Jesus did on the cross. You see, you're like the bride and he's like the husband and you went and committed adultery. And he forgave you. And forgiveness. And, and, and it works with reconciliation. It also works with God and then that comes as an issue of the temple. How do I make up for my sins and my shortcomings when I've sinned against God? I offer a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. That's what Jesus was doing on the cross. So, am I living in the truth? What is the truth? And, and very important is when I get taken to court and somebody accuses me. You know that Satan is the great accuser, right? The Hebrew word for Satan is to accuse. And I've been accused of being a sinner worthy of hell. And I'm pretty sure he's right. What, do, what can I possibly do? Well, I'm in court. The accusations are being hurled at me. I have no hope. I'm looking at the judge, and I know that he doesn't play fast and loose with the law, but he's upright and he's good. And then he says, not guilty. And I'm sitting there going, how does he do that? And it's because I put my faith in Jesus. And Jesus died in my place. And God is willing to accept that. And so now my sins aren't counted against me. And the truth is, is the accuser is wrong because the judge says, not guilty. I've been set free. That's justification. That's what the word means. You've been justified. It's coming from the courtroom, a place where truth gets established in the ancient world. The cross gets explained that way. So we've, we've got all of these images from, from the way that we live, and each one of these words has a picture that would have they would have easily felt and related with and known. And for us, it's a little more abstract. But, but if you start developing the picture, if you start, when you see the word redemption, picturing a marketplace where people are on, up on blocks being sold off into slavery, and then somebody says, wait, stop! I'll buy them, and I'm setting them free. Now you're getting a little more of the emotional weight of what Paul's trying to communicate here. Um, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the sun he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Okay, so, Thanksgiving, prayer report. Um, he's, we're now beginning to get into the body of the letter. Um, and the very first thing that we get is we get an explanation of Jesus. Um, this also is 
characteristic of Paul in that in the first half of his letter, he tends to ground you in theology, a knowledge of God, who Jesus is. Um, and, then, and, then, and then he moves forward and then he tells you, okay, in light of who Jesus is, how now should we live? It should look something like this. This was the, this was, now, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not cut and dry. So it's not like, okay, today we're going to do Theology 101, and then I give you a theological lecture, and then tomorrow I'll give you Praxis, and we'll talk about how to apply it into your daily life. It's a little bit more organic, where you'll get some application stuff in, in, in the theology, and you'll, and you'll get some theology in the application sections, but, but, there, but, but there tends to be that in Paul, in some of his letters at least. Um, He's been talking about Jesus. He's been talking about God the Father. He's been talking about the Holy Spirit. But, but a big part of this is focusing in on the Son and who he is and what he's done and, and how he has purchased us, how he has set us free. And so now he's going to draw our attention to say, okay, I want you to look at Jesus. I want you to remember who we're talking about when we talk about him who laid his life down for you. Now, just so you know, this little section here of Colossians 1, 15 through um, 20, it'll, it'll go a little bit more, but it is, um, is, is one of the high points in the New Testament as far as describing the nature of who Jesus is. Remember when we were in Philippians and we were in 2, 5 through 11, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God. That's one of the great New Testament passages that tell us about the person of Jesus. Colossians is another one. Um, now, here's a, here's a great principle, you know, because this is about radical discipleship. You know what radical discipleship really is? It's being head over heels in love with Jesus where he's first in your life. Um, you know, one of the simple questions, or there's a couple of simple questions that I ask, but the first one is this. Am I falling more in love with God? Am I falling more in love with the Father, with the Son, with the Holy Spirit? Is my, does my heart beat with passion for Jesus? When I'm falling more in love, when, I, when, I, when, when I'm pursuing him, when, when he's at the center of my life, I, I can be, I can have great confidence that I, this is where God wants me. I'm, I'm on the right path. The second question is, am I growing more in love with people? Because they're the closest that I get to see Jesus. Um, he died for them. So, you know, it's great. It's, it, and really this is just great commandment, but it's just, it's very good practical discipleship of am I growing more in love with God? Am I growing more in love with people? Now, whatever you do, if it's not helping those two things happen, it's probably not worthwhile. You know, and so this becomes a thing where sometimes, especially in our evangelical traditions, we get these little um, routines and, and then they become the standards of what's spiritual. So, you want the secret to the good life? You need to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and you need to plan on having an hour and a half daily devotional every day. And if you don't have the daily devotional every day, and when you do your daily devotional, you need to have a journal, because everybody should journal, because it's the right thing to do. And you should plan on at least reading through the Bible once a year, because no good Christian would never not read through the Bible once a year. And then you need to have your prayer list. And on your prayer list, it should probably be... Now, it, I say that, but people have had experiences of here's how you do it. And, and then it becomes a type of a law. And then if they don't do it the way that this person did it, then it becomes the issue, well, you must not be a very good Christian and maybe God doesn't love you. Now, there's much wisdom in all of that, that you being in God's word regularly, you praying, you being organized, you have, you know, you using some help to be 
introspective, all good stuff. It's just not a law. And, and, and it can get in the way if you don't have the proper understanding of what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And what he wants you to do is to grow in love, love of him, love of others. So here we have Paul, and what he's doing is he's, 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 this is what I'm praying for. I'm praying for your growth, that you would mature, that you would live a good life, that you would live a life worthy of the gospel, remembering what he has done for you. And then the very first thing he does is he draws our attention to focus on Jesus. Why? Because when you spend time with Jesus, when you know him, you will love him. To know him is to love him. I mean, it, how can you not? I mean, we, it, but sometimes we don't pay attention, right? Sometimes we, we just are in too big of a rush and we walk right on by. Or, well, I've read this, uh, you know, I've read this a hundred times. I've heard sermons on this. I, been there, done that. And, you know, this is one of the great things. Familiarity breeds contempt. How do we sustain this over time? And sometimes we have to slow down. And this is the value of Bible study. And then we, we listen. Do, do I really understand what's being said here? What do these words mean? What, what, what are the Old Testament allusions that Paul is drawing upon um, so that I can get a deeper understanding? But the goal here isn't to appear deep. The goal here is to know Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Um, were Jews allowed to make images of God? No. Why not? The Ten Commandments. But go deeper. <laughs> why, why does God say no images? Why, why is it a command? Because, because that image can't capture his reality. You don't handle me. I handle you. You sit there and you think that you're, you're, you're creating a representation of me by what you've done with your hands when I made you myself? So, so it's a safeguard against us that we wouldn't put God in a box and think that he could be handled or to think anything that we could create or comprehend or do could in any way end up capturing the reality of who he is. Fundamental. I mean, this, I mean, this is one of the, the very most fundamental realities of what distinguished the Jews from every other culture. Every other culture made idols. You go into the temple, and there's the image. Oh, your God looks something like that. People, you know, I mean, Aristophanes' Epiphanes went into the temple in Jerusalem, and where's the idol? There is none. He's beyond words. We can't capture him. We don't handle him. He handles us. So, the people who try to prove the existence of God, I said, well, that's kind of crazy because God created you. <laughs> yes. Or even worse, people who tried to disprove the existence of God. But, um, now, maybe that's why it's the first one. <laughs> now, See what we just did here, though, is we slowed down and we put this word into its biblical context in part. And see, we sit there and we go, okay, no images, no images, no images. It can't, God can't be captured in an image. But what does it say about Jesus? He is the image. Now, no idols, but there is one being in the universe that is described as bearing the image of God, and it's us. And that's and that's the other place that you go to. Okay, we don't we don't make any images, but we humans are image bearers 
um, the Greek word icon. Um, and then, and then you, you, you sit in this and you sit there and go, okay, so there's, there's two ways that this idea of image gets used in the Bible. Um, it can be a symbol. This points to that. And that's really what the, the, the commandment was talking about. Don't try to create a symbol thinking that this points to that because nothing that you create can capture the reality of who God is. But there's also the sense that the image can be the manifestation, you know, like, the, you know, like manifesting the actual presence of God. And the call to be the image bearers was more like that. The question is, what about the image of the cross? Okay. So, what? But where's your question? I mean, I'm, it's. I mean, we're saying don't make images, don't make. Oh. What about that? Okay, so. Um, I think we're gonna. Uh, if it if it doesn't bother you too much, we'll stop with that, and then when we come back, on Monday. It, and so it'll be on the video portion, you know, but. Is we'll, I'll, I'll give you a little history of, of the whole iconoclasm controversy through church history. Uh -oh. I, I, I mean, I, it, it, Sorry. I mean, you you asked a, you asked a great question, which is, well, we, we what about the cross? And you know, so and I'll give you like a little brief teaser. Okay. Notice the difference between a Protestant cross and a Catholic cross. Christ is not on the cross, and, and then, now there's more to it than that, but that, and, and, and there was a reaction because one of the concerns was is that everybody understood in the beginning that the artistry that we do to give symbols of our faith, a fish, a cross, a crucifix, isn't supposed to be the idol. It isn't. It's just, it's in that, it's just a symbol. And we, we don't think that God is actually a cross. What we're celebrating is what God did on the cross. Right. But over time, when you give somebody something to handle, our hearts are little idol factories. And then those symbols become more. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this next week. Um, did anybody have any prayer requests here? We didn't. I wasn't able to do it online, but well, let me close this in prayer then. Lord, we uh, we again lift up Scott to you and pray blessings over him. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for Carol, and thank you that she is with you. We lift up Sean and pray that things have gone well for her puppy, and uh, pray your blessings for her. Um, we thank you, Lord, for your word, and we thank you. Um, for this call, this invitation um, to grow up um, and this prayer of Paul um, helping us understand that, that yes, we, we should be praying for our maturity in you because of who you are, because of what you've done for your glory and to give you pleasure. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, God bless. Have a wonderful day. And uh, we will be back on Monday at 9 in the morning.